Um, welcome everybody to our Scholar Strike event. Uh, my name is Travis Hay and I'm a postdoctoral scholar at Lakehead University, as well as a historian of settler colonialism in Thunder Bay. Following the lead of black academics as well as black athletes who have decided to strike against what has been unfortunately the relentless onslaught of racist, anti-black and colonial police brutality, Myself and other members of faculty at Lakehead University are withholding our regular teaching and admin duties today and tomorrow in solidarity and in a larger strike uh, of scholars um, to bring attention to this issue. So in the midst of this strike, as I'm sure many people are aware, we're also following a call to hold public teach-ins, uh, events that are safe and that are accessible to community, where we can discuss uh, issues related to uh, black and indigenous responses to police violence in Thunder Bay. That will be the goal for our conversation today, but of course we're seeking to put today's event, which is kind of locally grounded in the more uh, context of Anishinaabe territory on the northern shores of Lake Superior. We're also seeking to put this into conversation with all the many wonderful events that we've been, uh, really had all of our rapt attention today. So I'm not gonna talk too much, because let's be real, no one wants to hear from this guy too much today, but I'm very lucky to be uh, moderating an excellent panel today. Um, where we have a wonderful array of radical scholars and activists. I'll introduce these panelists um, and then I'll ask them to uh, slowly unmute themselves and bring themselves on video um, as we get this call and conversation going. There'll also be a chance for folks following along on the YouTube channel to post any comments or questions that you might have um, so that we can share those with uh, the panel as well. So the first member of our panel today is Ivory Tuesday who is from Kuchiching First Nation in Treaty 3 area. She is a volunteer with Window Debway Masoan or Walking in Truth, uh, which does a community safety patrol and other organizing around uh, our community in Thunder Bay. Um, Ivory knows a lot about direct action and what that looks like in the context of resisting police violence. And we're very grateful and very happy to have her on the panel today. Um, our second panelist is Nehi Patrick Ibini Jesu, who is a Nigerian intellectual whose uh, very cutting edge theoretical research looks into the politics of black identity on Anishinaabe land. And so his scholarship addresses both post-colonial theory and settler colonial theory, but he also has a lot to say um, about what he terms the martial caste or his way of referring to uh, the policing class, um, which I'm sure we'll talk more uh, about with him today. And our third and final panelist is A.D. King, who is a black feminist activist whose community organizing addresses race, colonialism, health, and identity. Um, AD has been in Thunder Bay for a very long time, and she has many thoughtful as well as many radical perspectives on the politics of community organizing, um, and to my mind, especially the kind of backlash politics that Black folks face in general and Black women face in particular when addressing issues of police violence or white supremacy. So if I could invite my fellow panelists to slowly come on to the call and bring on their audio as well as their video. We'll start to slowly get a conversation going. Uh, now, thanks so much for joining me, everyone, because we did organize this very quickly. So I didn't really have a necessary uh, order that I wanted to go in. Um, so I didn't want to put anyone in too much of a hot spot. So before I just uh, start asking uh, what you guys wanted to chat about, I was just wondering if anyone wanted to uh, correct any introductions I might have messed up or just really just give us any opening thoughts that, that you've had about, uh, you know, responses to police violence in Thunder Bay from both black and indigenous folks. Well, I'll just start off. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I've been giving the message of Black Lives Matter in Thunder Bay since um, about 2016. But even before that, I grew up here, moved down south and then moved back. And uh, just touching on some of your points, uh, I have constantly been at odds with white people in power when I bring it up. There's a lot of silencing, um, a lot of uh, silence when you speak, but then when you leave the room, people will start talking and dissenting with what you're saying. Uh, and Thunder Bay in particular, I think that uh, the population does not want to acknowledge racism uh, towards Black or Indigenous people. And I think that it's because they see it as so normal that they are not willing to challenge their point of views and the lifestyle that they become accustomed to and their 
family values that have been passed down for generations up here in the north. Yeah, sometimes I call it that blue bubble that everyone lives in, right? It doesn't really get burst that much. And then when it does, people aren't happy that it's uh, it's been burst. Mm -hmm. can, I, uh, can I throw you on the spot, Ivory? Just because I know you got tons to uh, to say on the subject. Uh, no, it was, uh, it was uh, thank you for the, the intro and just glad to be here today um, with everyone. Um, just, I don't know, I guess um, uh, whoever wants to start first is cool with me. Um, uh, I guess I'll, do you, um, do you want me to start or? Yeah, that's but, good. If no yeah. one else has an issue, I'd love to hear from you okay. uh, first. Let's do it. Okay, I'll start off. Um, I'll be relying heavily on some slides. So, um, so I'm doing that because, uh, so people can like pause on uh, some of the info that, um, that are on the slides. Um, since this is recorded live, and there's also a portion that will be taken out, um, but yeah, um, we'll get to that later. But uh, um, yeah, so I just, just want to say welcome and thank you um, everyone out there for joining us today. And thank you to the IL department, uh, social justice department and uh, rival Reimagine Value Action Lab for um, putting this together and um, for inviting us to speak here today. And, honored to be here and speak among uh, some amazing friends um, and uh, about speaking about the community responses to um, police violence locally. A uh, common theme I'm seeing in some of the panels that are broadcasted is on Turtle Island are how do we move forward without reproducing oppression and state violence and uh, I'm going to focus my presentation on uh, forms of transformative justice and rethinking community safety. So I'll just move to the slides now. Okay, so community safety from racialized policing in the context of Thunder Bay. Uh, I dedicate this to the survivors who have lived to tell their stories, warn each other, and live with scars forever in their hearts for those who strove to survive and have gone on to the stars. Thank you to all those who dedicate their time and risk their lives confronting settler colonialism and violence. And I'm just going to stop my video for a bit. I think you can still hear me. Um, and sorry, I can see my slides here. Tatum states that a subordinate group has to focus on survival in a situation of unequal power. Borrowing from Black abolition feminist scholar Andrea Ritchie, movements against police violence should promote nurturing values, visions, and practices. Friere's underlying message of conscientization and pedagogy of the oppressed is that it is everyone's responsibility to respond to the situation positively and thoughtfully. Uh, sorry, my slides are moving slow. Um, so beyond imagining and into practicing, um, part of a, a, a group uh, within Thunder Bay, as Travis mentioned, um, uh, the patrol is made up of caring volunteers friend, and friends is dedicated to imagining and creating a feminist and decolonized form of community safety together in Thunder Bay. We formed to raise up the voices of the silence and to respond to the violence in our community, especially against women, two-spirit people, and youth. We formed because the city's leadership and police uh, have not proven themselves worthy of the community's trust, and we formed to help all people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, through love, care, and solidarity. Uh, to get there, we focus on delivering care in many forms. We share stories and speak truth to power. We trade skills and build relationships. We patrol the streets and hold workshops. We refuse to assume people in need are dangerous and we hold the powerful, including the police, accountable. We share information and feed the people. We practice contextual fluidity and rely on grassroots methods like the Mox and Telegram for our communication. We are producing a new world through our relationships and actions. We don't react, we create. We believe that safety, equity, peace, and abundance are possible for everyone. We believe in a world without prisons or police. So through relationships and land, we are converting Canadians to collaborate against ongoing settler colonial violence and structures. We occupy space contesting settler occupation. And uh, this is uh, McIntyre and Nibing River. And uh, a lot of tragedy has happened here with uh, 
with youth that have um, gone missing and have been found in this river. Um, as people have known, uh, fallen feathers. Um, also, we drag the river uh, periodically and also uh, we surveil the shipyards um, counter, uh, as counter surveillance. And here's us uh, handing out people. This is where Mox and Telegram happens. Um, people let us know uh, where to go in the community and what's happening. Um, throughout the summer, we handed out masks, uh, food. Uh, this is the life-saving uh, situation sometimes that we're in. Um, and uh, Benita St. Lawrence states that uh, the Indigenous community is the most heavily surveilled um, in Canada. And this is also true for uh, Black and racialized people. Uh, the embodied psychic effects of surveillance include nervous tensions, insomnia, fatigue, accidents, lightheadedness, and less control over reflexes. Um, and this is the, the police that have been uh, kind of watching us um, when we were checking in on people. And uh, so yeah, definitely experience uh, these, <laughs> these feelings when that happens. Uh, settler colonial strategy is a part of a broader population management system in biopolitical ordering. In the logic of elimination, settler governmentality aims to dispossess Indigenous peoples from the land for a new white social order and reforms indigeneity through flexible regimes, uh, forms of authoritarian oversight, imposing colonial strategies. And these are good guides to, um, to check out if uh, you're organizing in your community. Um, arrest handbook. A uh, guide for people who rely on public space, know your rights. And generally, police cannot stop you, make you answer questions, or search your belongings. This applies to everyone, even if you have a criminal record or on parole. The only exceptions are if the police have a search warrant or an arrest warrant in your name, or if you're being detained or arrested. So this is um, pictures of local street checks, um, all of them illegal. And once you start recording, uh, the police um, eventually let people go. So um, also security guards, you want to watch out um, for violence. Uh, when arrested, one has the right to be told why one is being arrested. Um, you have a right to be searched in a reasonable manner and to remain silent. Uh, if you ask uh, to speak with a lawyer, the police may not continue to question you. Um, do not answer any questions until you have spoken to a lawyer and police must give you your right to counsel and respect your right to silence. And this is um, you know, something people can pause on and, and check out, come back to later. Um, why am I uh, under arrest, being detained? Uh, these are quotes that you can say um, if you find yourself that um, being arrested. Uh, to identify a specific police officer, uh, to find their uh, surname and badge number, you look on their sleeves or kind of at chest level here. Um, locally, the police have uh, cruiser numbers uh, located on the side, also uh, on the back of the cruiser. You also want to get the license plates. And creating safety with technology, uh, monitoring and documenting police behavior. So um, you can use cell phones, dash cams, body cams, trail cams. Um, recording and documenting police actions is a well-known strategy for community members to demand police accountability. Uh, recording them, observing their actions. This is legal as long as you keep a reasonable distance and are not physically interfering with an investigation. Um, if you have questions about an officer's conduct, you can ask them questions such as, why are you on site? Uh, they do not have to answer your questions, but their information may be helpful. Whenever possible, record with another person. Uh, if you're interacting with police, do your best to have another person present. If you're filming, try to do so with a group of people. Uh, overall, there are four situations when police can take your phone. It's when you consent or when the person in pos possession of the cell phone is being arrested, when there is a search warrant, and if the officer believes you will delete the video. With strong factors as to why you would be deleting the video you're creating. So reassure them you won't destroy the video. Um, if they do not have grounds to take your phone um, or camera, you don't give it to them if they request it. It's okay to say no. Uh, do not give your passcode if they do not have grounds to take your phone. Uh, please record at a safe distance 
and don't obstruct and intervene. Uh, be sure to make two copies of the video and give it to two trusted friends. So if the police tell you to stop filming, advise them it is not illegal to film an officer. If the police tell you to leave an area, advise them I'm not, I'm just observing, I'm not interfering. Um, you can say my phone is not evidence and I do not consent to you taking it. Uh, you can offer to send the video if they tell you the recording may produce evidence of a crime. And uh, this is uh, one of our patrols are recording the, the police here um, that had been uh, harassing people that were um, just sitting around hanging out. Uh, later, uh, they pull up behind us and try to intimidate. Try, try to intimidate us while while we're on patrol, kind of staring us down. So we were getting reports of. Um, Starlight tours and um, other instances of police brutality, which was pretty horrible, um, very traumatic for people. Um, so basically, that's pretty much, I believe, why the page was shut down. Um, so yeah, you can start recording, or <laughs> Max can start recording uh, um, on the YouTube um around this part now uh safe organizing law enforcement agencies do not have encryption keys to the telegram app uh therefore they cannot make sense of the data so you can uh, organize safely using telegram one known, known as one of the best um uh apps also um covering your your face um as ai facial recognition is being used um so uh yeah just making sure like be, being careful with pictures when you're at solidarity events and um, uh, pro protesting events. Um, also use or create safe spaces to organize, organize using contextual fluidity. Um, so it's a theory that builds on communities, people's strengths and informal supports, adaptable resilience, evolving, respond to context, builds open and trusting relationships and embraces connection and the unpredictability of life. So um, can be really creative with this and uh, make safe spaces or you know, find safe spaces through uh, relationships. Warnings and consider all situations that may arise, ask for help. So um, uh, say uh, KKK or Sons of Odin, Proud Boys, um, these are groups that actually exist locally. Um, so you want to be careful. Um, just yeah, just be cautious. Um, Anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism is on the rise. Um, so what you can do, follow and amplify pages or accounts on social media, learn the names of the land you live on and the nations who have lived there, uh, call out racism in your friends and family, attend a solidarity event, uh, don't burden racialized people with educating you, study up with documentaries, podcasts, books, police interact with people. Um, so safe walking practices, um, take the bus if you can, walk in twos if you can. Um, I saw somebody, um, uh, walking one time they were taking 20 steps and then they would turn around and walk a few steps backwards and then um, go ahead and, and turn back around and then and keep walking 20 steps and I thought that was pretty amazing uh, strategy so um, if uh, if you're being stalked pretend like you arrived at your home I used this one time pretended that like I was near my yard um, but it wasn't my home <laughs> pretended like I was about to go into the house um, and then they had just, um, the, the person that was stalking had just uh, drove away. If you can't shake the person stalking, use your phone, hold it up to your ear. If you feel confident, show them you're recording, uh, go live on Facebook or any social media platform. Walk in between the sidewalk and properties, um, ready to knock on someone's door or window. Uh, walk from one side of the street to the other frequently. Um, try to let this person know you know you see them. Um, do not accept rides from strangers, no matter how friendly they may seem, and uh, run from erasure. And um, 12 scenarios instead of calling the police. This is um, from the Washtenaw Solidarity Defense. So um, you know, people can check out this link. It's pretty amazing. Um, and keep using your platforms and don't give in to tone policing or silencing tactics. Um, a lot of gaslighting happens in Thunder Bay on a lot of the hate pages. Um, 
there's two particular hate hate uh, pages that um, you know people uh, a lot of racism racist uh, comments and uh, gaslighting happens there. Um, creating safety with traditional modes of communication using the Mox and Telegraph. Um, it's an exchange of news information through social networks, especially by casual information, conversation, rumor, or gossip. It is a branch of the oral tradition and can be considered an indigenous memory technique. Uh, it is simple, complex, and highly detailed and has sur survived accurately for thousands of years. Uh, the original meaning referred to indigenous people relying on runners to carry messages between communities. Now it has been adapted to the internet world. Uh, so what we do as volunteers, we go into the community and uh, we, we do this on, on foot by a vehicle and uh, we, um, you know, go from people to people and uh, let them know what's happening in the community. Um, so people started using platforms on social media and web pages uh, as counter surveillance to, to alert each other when and where there is danger. Uh, Mox and Telegram is strong and communication is key because these conversations can lead to changes. Um, so it's to carry knowledge, challenge conditions, and incite change. Uh, this knowledge system is emerging for reasons of safety, survival, and is in some instances restricted from those in positions of power and colonial authority. Um, keep your Mox and Telegram strong and look to other communities that use its forms. Um, Erica Violet Lee, activist, scholar, and poet, uh, mentioned in one of her talks uh, in Saskatoon, they use what she refers to as whisper networks. Um, and also, uh, Arnak Arnak Baril, Inuk filmmaker and activist, commented in the article, um, Nunavut's answer to the Me Too movement, explained that we talk, especially as women, we talk about who is safe to be around, who's not. There are whisper networks. And transmotion is a sense of native motion and native memory having a unique sense of sovereignty and can be performative. This adaptation of tribal modes of communication acts as resistance under the extreme colonial pressures of erasure, allowing the critical task of survival and cultural continuity. So mapping the racial spatiality of the colonial city as many of the stories stem from these areas of racial spatial economies in Thunder Bay. The Mox and Telegrams creates uh, safety using indigenous ways of knowing and serves as the function of storytelling and survival, uh, emerging, emerge, emerging as indigenous surveillance, uh, which is counter surveillance. Um, these are, uh, this is the Terry Fox Monument, uh, Lakeshore Drive. This is out by Ignace uh, on the way, highway, highway to Duluth, highway to Kikabeka. And um, so um, this, it's marked with amethyst out here, um, Mission Marsh. It's where people have been uh, left on starlight tours. Um, so this is a um, you know, pretty heavy topic. Um, but yeah, this is um, yeah just a collection of uh, the stories and where people have been left. So stories give new insight using personal narratives into what people have endured and with it the time and space to reflect on those experiences helping co-create empathy. Sharing stories uh, provides a counter to the settler, settler colonial tactic of ongoing acts of surveillance and genocide of indigenous peoples. The Mox and Telegram is positioned as an act of surveillance. So what I've learned, some insight with um, my time uh, volunteering in, in Thunder Bay is that accountability is safety. Um, in you know, smaller, small forms, um, and uh, these acts of, the, you know, coming together, this is, um, you know, count, accountability is safety. Uh, it's important to create safe spaces for survivors and family. And this is us outside the jail here. Um, communication is safety, um, sending out uh, alerts, um, helps people you know survive out there anonymity is safety and sovereignty is safety um anonymity is very important um you know for you know, people that might have like uh, malicious intentions um to hurt say uh, our volunteers or um uh, you have to also be careful with media uh, the, the media will twist um stories as well to to cater to the dominant narrative. So be careful with media. Um, sovereignty is safety, uh, as in like indigenous governance, um, uh, relying on our clan systems that have been uh, existing for thousands of years and traditional modes of communication. 
we are all tasked with the incredibly hard work of envisioning and enacting alternatives to the police that will genuinely produce safety for survivors and targets of interpersonal and community violence. Andrea Ritchie. So that is everything. Um, well, thanks for <laughs> And yeah, about it. So I'll take questions near the end. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. So we'll let people uh, gather up questions on YouTube and we'll have a question period at the end. I was gonna have, uh, we're next on the schedule, we're gonna have AD speak, but just in giving her a chance to set up and get everything ready, I was just wondering, since I haven't had the chance to speak with you yet, Nahi or Patrick, are you, uh, are you there, are your mic on? Yes, my mic is on. Yeah. Hi, Travis. Do you mind just giving us a minute or two, maybe just as a brief response is what you had to uh, Ivory's talk, just while uh, Adria gets ready? Okay. Um, yes, she, she, she presents, Ivory presents a very, very powerful um, treatment about um, systemic racism and how it works and how um, what I call in my own theorizing the Marshall case, right, is used to subdue. And um, as I probe a lot further, um, looking at Leanne Simpson's work and ideas about um, normativity about grounded normativity so she uses the concept of grounded normativity as a resistance to but i said no we, we need to first of all be able to diagnose there's a method around what we are seeing here in thunder bay and i call it the imperialist normativity and you see a lot of us get co-opted i'm an arrivant right i'm black and i'm an arrivant and a lot of us get co-opted, first of all, by the language. We speak in English. We think in English. We've, we're having this meeting in English. And so at some point, certain nuances that also facilitate violence, right, gets, we pass it along as well, or we imbibe it. And so I think that apart from the four pillars that I address, there's, there's something that is a substructure that we don't see, which AD refers to. I mean, I'm standing in a space in Thunder Bay, and I know that I'm black. I've never felt that way, but I know I'm, I'm, there's an awareness because of the way people are looking at me. And um, I, I find it really important that this kind of violence, which is not spoken, right, is something that is internalized. And so in addressing these issues um, as they collaborate or conspire with each other, it's first to go to where the normativity, how these things get normalized, right? And it, it, I think, first of all, it starts in the language and then religion, heteropatriarchy, neoliberalism. It's the same thing. They're just parallels of each other, okay? So I, I, I also present the idea of Black, white and red, and how that in the English language, they're actually metaphors. They're not, we, we shouldn't take them literal, right? Or literally. I have a background in economics, and we know that production is based on land, is based on capital, and is based on labor. And very frankly, if you draw the parallels, very frankly, capital is white, labor is black and land is red. And it's the same parallels. And these things get normalized into the way we see things. And so there's the idea about the black body, and there's the idea about the red land. And these things, I want us to just hold it at the back of our minds, but these are the things that eventually act as the software for the kind of behavior that we see that gets normalized. And so these acts as a substru substructure on which colonialism builds through white supremacy, right? And then through an identity colonization and through um, what I call the Marshall case, which is the police in my part of the world, where, which is a post-colonial society. It's the army that is subservient to a colonial structure. And then... Yeah 
there's also the violence of space. And as we look at these four interactions, right? And, and I, have a, I have a very beautiful example coming to Thunder Bay. Now, I've been here for a year and I had a different view of Canada when I was outside. When I came in, it was really different. And I, I, was, I was in shock because what we get sold um, outside is very different from here. Now, Thunder Bay is exactly like Soweto. It's exactly like South Africa. The experience I have with Thunder Bay is the same with Soweto. And when you look at, and, and I mean, forgive me, but I don't like to refer to the indigenous people here as the Fort Williams First Nation. There's a reason why. But, but you see the same violence. The road that leads out to the reserve has a name that is injurious to the indigenous women and girls of, of, of in Thunder Bay. It is, it is injurious to them. The very name Fort William First Nation is also an act of violence. So you begin to see that the violence is multifaceted. It's multifaceted. It's, it's along the four pillars. There's white supremacy, yes. There's the colonization of, of, of um, identity, when you refer to a, the name of the road, and I, I can't use that name for propriety reasons, but I mean, if that, that road has existed for, for so long, then the questions are, what are in the minds of indigenous women? What are in the minds of indigenous girls about their own identity, just driving along that road? That's one of the things that comes to me. And then because these things happen, they're they interrelated. They're they are, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are so interconnected. Meaning that if I can abuse you with space, then I can abuse your body through the police. You've given me permission. And so it's that idea of fighting the superstructure from all four points. A, a few weeks ago, I think Jessica Moroni, um, there was a gaffe in the news and her, her husband came on air to try to defend her. And the first thing he acknowledged was, I want to acknowledge my privilege first. And in acknowledging privilege, it's a violence. It's saying I'm better than you. It's saying that this is my country, right? And, and, and all of these nuances, we don't talk about them because there's the political correctness that goes into being Canadian. But you see, these are the, these, it's those fine layers. I'm from Nigeria, and it's those fine layers that I see that get papered over. And then I think I have conversations with some of my friends from time to time to say that the French colonialism is very different from the English colonialism, the British colonialism, which is, Somewhat, somewhat subtle, politically correct. And so I'm going to stop here because I think it is probably ready now. But these ideas are things that we have to fight from all fronts. If we tackle only the identity colonization and say Black Lives Matter and we tackle the police, then white supremacy will continue to thrive on one side and spatial violence will continue to thrive at another end. And so in removing the entire system, we need to tackle that software, which I call the imperialist normativity. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, A.D. Thank you, Danny. Yeah. Um, I, that was wonderful. I think, uh, A.D., if you feel comfortable, if you want to uh, just jump in rather than have me drum roll too much, I'd just love to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, in response to Ivory's presentation, uh, I really liked the part about um, the complexity theory and about redefining safe spaces because I think what's really important in activism is knowing that these safe places are constantly shifting and that previous safe places may now be sites of colonialism and new ones are always popping up. Uh, so it's really important and also um, just relationship building as well because activism is extremely hard on your psychology and on your body. And so um, people will have periods of burnout and then it's, okay, who's active right now? And respecting people who are resting and respecting the people who are out on the field and doing a lot of the actions. 
Uh, so recently in Thunder Bay, two months ago, we had a Black Lives Matter protest. Uh, it was during the pandemic. And the media right away was talking about how Black people were trying to infect the community. Uh, there was a lot of media about uh, how was it going to be safe? Was there going to be social distancing? Were people going to be wearing face masks? One day before all this media about the Black Lives Matter protests, there was a video that showed a lineup because winners just reopened and there were a bunch of white people in line, not social distancing, most of them not wearing masks and there was no reaction by the community. So a bunch of people can go shopping and line up. It was a big crowd, not social distancing and they won't get a reaction because of their privileged uh, skin color and place in the society. But just the mention of black people organizing uh, created this fear as if the virus was gonna come from black people and from community organizing. Uh, at this Black Lives Matter rally, I made a speech about peace. That's what it was focused on and about redefining what violence is to the community. Uh, I started off and I said, peace can be defined as the absence of violence. I know a lot of you will be familiar with these words uh, by Johan Galtung, who is nicknamed the father of peace studies. And I talked about how Bell Hooks famously defines Western countries as imperial, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchies. Uh, black people have never lived in this country since the moment that we were trafficked here from Africa. Uh, we have never been living in peaceful times. We have, we have never known peace. We have constantly been subjected to violence and this violence has changed. And as uh, Nehikari said, it's become politically correct and it's become normal. The violence against black people is so normal now. It's normalized and people are um, just used to black people being demeaned and dehumanized by the state. Uh, at this rally, uh, Chief Sully Hoth went to the media and she said, yeah, I agree with this protest, but um, you know, all lives matter. So one of the things that I always say to activists is that if people can't argue with what you're saying, if they can't argue that there's a reason for the protest, that the death or the targeting or the maiming of black people is not violent, if they can't argue that, then they'll start to have a problem with how you're doing it. And so that's the next line of attack. It will be, well, it's not that I don't, it's not that I agree with racism or that I don't see this as wrong. I just think that the phrase Black Lives Matter is discriminatory. So I completely agree with you. I just, I don't like how you're saying it. And so then the policing starts to be on your protesting. And you'll see white people, well, I wouldn't have a problem with them protesting if they did it this way. The point of a protest is to be disruptive. That is what a protest is. It's, it's meant to be disruptive. It's meant to get attention. And it's a peaceful action, completely peaceful. Even if um, no matter what kind of protest is happening, it will always be defined as peaceful because it's interrupting a system that is violent. And the means that are used are necessary to the end. And so right now we're in a period of time where our protests are very explicitly peaceful because black people feel a need to prove that we're, uh, that we're civilized because we're told that we're not. But if I look back on the history of my people, we got rights because we went into the streets. That's what happened. We went into the streets and that's the only reason why I got to go to school and why my dad got to go to school and why I have the right to vote. That's the only reason. So when people are policing even how we protest and disagreeing with what we're saying because of how we protest and because uh, if we block a road and it interrupts them, then they have a problem. That is another form of racism. And these people are not allies to the cause because it is no business of anyone with privilege and power in the white supremacist patriarchy to be telling the oppressed people who are racialized how to protest. Uh, when we rally, um, again, as I said, we're accused of being divisive, troublemakers going against um, the state, which people become very protective of. 
Um, and when we are violated by the police, you'll see a lot of white people on social media rush to defend the actions. Well, if Breonna Taylor hadn't gone out with that guy a couple years ago, maybe she wouldn't be dead. Meanwhile, she was sleeping in her room. Um, well, if he didn't have a weapon, maybe he wouldn't have been shot. Yet armed shooters like Kyle Ritterhouse, who are mass shooters, extremely violent, having psychotic episodes, and who are white men, are peacefully arrested. We constantly see these disparities in the treatment of black people and white people when they're arrested. We've learned that there will always be excuses, but even when we cooperate, like Philando Castile in Minneapolis, and even if we're unconscious or sleeping, they will still be violent against us. Floyd went unconscious, and yet still there was violent action and pressure on him. Breonna Taylor was asleep. There's a common misunderstanding um, and message that's given by the state that we're in a post-racial society and that the people who speak up are nitpicking or just unhappy and you know if you're not happy here then you can leave. However, an example that I love bringing up all the time is by Jane Elliott. She's a well-known diversity trainer. Uh, you guys have probably seen videos of her. She does the famous experiments of the um, labeling people as blue eyes or brown eyes and then um, showing racism. But she got up in front of a group of um, middle class working white people and she said, raise your hand if you want to be black. No one raised their hand. So she said again, oh, you must not have understood me. Who here wants to be black? And nobody raised their hand. So there is an innate understanding by the white majority and by people in power that being black is lesser than that there is active racism in our society. Because if there was not that innate understanding that black is lesser, then people would have no problem raising their hand. And yet they didn't. And these same people were trying to deny that they are racist. But again, there are misunderstandings about what racism is. Racism doesn't mean that you are using certain words or being explicitly physically violent um, with your language or your body, there's an internalized racism and hierarchy about who is more, who is worth more, um, the roles that people need to play in society. Um, and so going back again to what Nehikari said about how black is labor and the black body is constantly capitalized, uh, which is, it's constantly um, our worth in a capital sense. Uh, and when we talk about systemic violence, we're talking about our values and what we consider normal and natural in our societies. Uh, and so when I'm talking about the backlash that we get for protesting, it's become normal to ignore rallies of police violence, whether it's against, um, whether the rally is for black or indigenous people, because at this point there are so many. But the fact that there are so many when each of them um, is usually sparked by protesting a specific death or incident with the police should show people how dire the situation is because it's not normal to be living in a militarized state where um, black and indigenous people are brought to the DJ, the local jail, beaten up and um, are subject to inhumane conditions while in custody. And that's considered normal. So in Thunder Bay, what people might not know um, if you're from outside of this area is that at our district jail, every inmate gets a day and a half served for one day because of the conditions. So that's their, their presence for enduring overcrowded rooms, um, infestations, not enough food, not good food. Uh, sometimes there's no access to clean water for hours. Um, rooms that are filthy. We've heard the stories, and so they're present for that as they get a day and a half for each day served. And it's been this way for years, and still there is no actual new prison being built. And I know that there are, that understanding from a theoretical, pre um, a theoretical perspective that jail doesn't work anyways, but still the conditions of ours are so bad. And it's normalized in the court system here. All right. The violence in our system silences black voices 
and it seeks also to silence our white allies who attempt to speak on behalf of us. When Ivory was talking about anonymity, that really rang true with me because uh, when you do start to become an activist, you are monitored and you do face a lot of violence. After the Black Lives Matter protest, there was a car around Thunder Bay that said white lives matter. And I said to my, uh, my activist friends, be very careful and make sure that you're not, follow you're not followed, following these same strategies that Ivory was talking about because people are getting very angry that racism is in the media and it's, they're being forced to acknowledge that they're a part of a racist system and they can follow you home, they can break your car windows um, because the, the reactions are starting to boil over. Um, one of the things with our systems of patriarchy and white supremacy, um, again, is that they create hierarchies. And based on this hierarchy, hierarchies created by these systems, they determine who is in the most need and who is the best. So men being better than women, white people better than others. Uh, but when you ask Indigenous and Black activists, we're constantly sending messages of equity and solidarity. But the white media and the um, media of the state will constantly silence these, silence and not publish or try and break down solidarity between Black and Indigenous people. Uh, they'll compete, they'll make it seem as if you have to compete for attention or compete for space. Um, and this is done purposefully to break down these relationships. Uh, but Black people will not be free until ind Indigenous people are free and vice versa. Um, when I went to the university in Thunder Bay, I would go into class and uh, most of the time I was the only Black person. But on the curriculum, there would be no Black feminists. Um, so I was in women's studies classes for reference. There would be no works by Black feminists or there would be maybe one. And I was mind boggled by that because Black feminism has had such an impact and still is having such an impact on that field. Uh, but it had been decided, I guess, that um, only white and indigenous voices matter because they were the mass, because they are the mass population of Thunder Bay. Uh, according to Toni Morrison, um, she says that the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. This is another quote that I love. It keeps you from doing your work and it keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Uh, this reminds me of being targeted and stopped by the police. You're constantly having to explain why you're somewhere or what you're doing there, uh, which happens to me as well. Um, in my work, I've had to uh, be in the courthouse, paid for my work, um, and been in high-risk areas. And whenever I'm there, I'm constantly being asked why I'm there. Or my car will be like, the police will be waiting by my car to see you know, who I am and ask for my license when it's just sitting there. Uh, it's hard to function and fit into white systems when your people are being actively targeted and killed. And it's uh, frustrating and we are angry, but our pain and our anger is constantly delegitimized by the system. Uh, there's constantly the dehumanization of black people that are, um, that our anger makes our claims unjustified. And yet our claims of unjustness are extremely justified because they're not, they're, you know, we're not protesting because somebody has a bruise. We're literally dying in the streets because of state violence and the oppression. In Thunder Bay, the targeting of black people uh, comes down to the fact that the black population has doubled in the past 15 years. So there's a core of people in Thunder Bay who are extremely unfamiliar with black faces and bodies and different accents. But also because um, in the past 15 years, um, there has been, uh, according, to, according to the police, gang activity from black gangs from Toronto who have expanded up here, um, presumably for the drug trade. However, in Thunder Bay, the oldest and largest gang is Hell's Angels. Hell's Angels is international. They're a well-known white supremacist gang. They're also known as the Big Red Machine. 
and they have been controlling the drug trade up here for decades. But yet, because of our systems and values, uh, black people are the gang members when the children of Hells Angels, of known Hells Angels members, walk around unscrutinized and unstopped in the city. Black people didn't bring drugs or gangs here. They were here already. But the black body that came here now is to blame and is targeted for all of it and has become synonymous with drugs and violence in this city. Uh, so I think just wrapping up what I want to say about Thunder Bay and the, my reaction to state violence is that um, there is physical violence, there is direct violence, but the precursor to that is the systemic violence. And it's how we normalize the dehumanization and the maiming and killing of black people. <laughs> I think, I don't know if Ivory or Nehi Kari had anything to say in conversation with me. Thanks so much, Aidy. Um, yeah, just um, with talks with uh, Aidy, there is, um, you know, she has so many stories of the, like the experiences in Thunder Bay. And, um, you know, same thing with uh, when we go volunteering, uh, we do see a lot of, um, there's black people that are stopped uh, by police, so we record them from a distance. And uh, it helps, it works. Um, so it's like our experiences are so similar and uh, like not the same, but very similar. And uh, thank you for your courage and your bravery for speaking up today. Thanks, Ivory. Our solidarity is strong despite um, the system trying to break it, break down our alliances. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Ad. I mean, um, many of the experiences that um, I probably have had personally, you kind of capture it very clearly. Um, and what I see for other Black people, I'm. Uh, I, I think yes, you you're very very clear on the ideas around blaming or denigrating and, and and actually that's the that's where the word comes from right and i think because i'm black i'm i'm able to use the word nigger but the word nigeria the word denigrate all come from the latin word nigger and that ability to colonize and blackball or blacklist or just make look bad um is it, something that that's why the that's the responsibility of white media that's why they are there uh, and um, it's part of the whole superstructure of colonialism which is that if you make people feel less than they are then they begin to think that way and, and that's why it's easy to normalize violence against them it's easy to just get away with um, so many things and so if we con continue to collaborate and then look at it from a very holistic view to say, look, white supremacy is um, a fallacy. Um, and then you also say that identity colonization is a fallacy. You can't call me names. And then you, we, we, we put our feet on the ground and say police brutality is also a fallacy. Then I think gradually, um, we'll begin to make a new normal because, I mean, this is what it's about. It's about making and pushing for a new normal. Canada can only make progress into the future if we embrace this new normal. Thank you very much, Aidy. Absolutely. Um, thank you for your responses. Um, exactly what I love to hear, which are people who are also providing new information. And I think I'll just hand it off to Travis and let Nehi Kari have his presentation. Yeah, Nehi, if you want to just keep going, please, we'd love to hear more from you, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Travis. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be speaking today. Um, basically, um, coming from Nigeria, which is, um, in my view, the largest 
white supremacy project in the world where 200 million people and um, Thunder Bay is everything I see in Thunder Bay, I see, I, I have experienced back home. And um, basically it just, my presentation bases colonialism on four pillars. And the ideas of using um, information and education systems to communicate that white is superior. And I like the way um, Tanaisi Quartz's uh, American writer puts it. He says they believe they are white. And, and in truth, um, if we interrogate the language, right, uh, white people are in white, right? The, the color is actually caramel or some other color. They aren't really white. White is not the color. My teeth is white. That's white. And so, uh, and then we are really black. And um, indigenous people are, are really, really red. And so we begin to see that these things are metaphors that mean something else. And if we do not interrogate the metaphors, then um, how are we different from the generation before us? And so that's what we need to put, that's, that's part of what I think we need to push or put forward. So the four pillars are thus. One, it's the idea of white supremacy. And um, we get taught in English, in Africa, or in French, or in Portuguese. And I think it's the same in Canada, where English and French are the predominant um, languages of teaching, while indigenous languages and cultures are de-emphasized. And so um, in dislodging colonialism, then they need to be pushed in that direction at some point. And then there's the idea of the colonization of identity. I mean, I'm from an artificial state and um, I, we're named by a British woman and, um, and she called us Nigeria. And Nigeria simply means nigger area. Very, sim very, very similar to Fort Williams First Nation. Fort means it's a barrack, right? And um, Williams is a white man. And I, I, I think that we should begin to interrogate the, the name Fort Williams First Nation because there's also the idea of colonizing identities. I'm not going to call the name of that road that links Thunder Bay with, um, but I mean, if you go on Google and just check it, you'll see what I'm talk talking about. The link road, that one road that links Thunder Bay with Fort Williams First Nations, it's a virulent and it's about colonizing indigenous bodies. It's about colonizing indigenous. And so in pushing back, we need to begin to question, right? 97% of the streets in Thunder Bay are named after white settlers. I, I, I've, I've, done the I've, I've done the research, 97. So we have um, claims that this land belongs to indigenous people and we give respect to the, Anish uh, the Anishinaabe people on which we do this work on their land, right? But 97% of the land is named after Anglos. And so there's the question of naming as well to say, how do we begin to rename, or not necessarily rename, but give a second name, give an indigenous name to every street in Thunder Bay? That begins to give a sense of ownership. If you, you only name, naming is, is, is about ownership. That's what naming is about. And so I can say that you own the land, but until I allow you to name the land, then you don't really own it. And so it's something that I also, um, it's an idea that I, I think we should also continue to explore, right? And it's closely linked to the Marshall case, which is that colonialism always functions with the Marshall case. If you look anywhere in the world, in the United States, there's redlining and, um, um, and redlining is marshaled by police. It's marshaled by lawyers. It's marshaled by, by realtors. In the same way that in Canada, it's marshaled by the RCMP, right? And so rights to indigenous land. And again, I'm just going to be calm because 
you can't say that indigenous rights is a fallacy in truth. If I own the land, then why should I have rights? Why should my rights be, in quotes, mentioned every time? The land, I give rights to whites to use, or I give rights to white settlers. I'm the one giving the rights. That, that should be the idea. But this is also another fallacy that I see here in, in Canada. And so the Marshall case, which is the police, which is the army, um, um, or the in, in Quebec, the, the police there, and um, the Oka crisis, we, we've seen the replaying of this case. And their purpose is very simple. Keep the people subjugated. Keep them sedated. Keep them so just dominate them and make them feel i mean when i came to canada so this is going to be my arrival experience i'm going to talk about slightly I, I i kept asking why were all the border patrol and policemen so heavily built <laughs> they were just so heavily built just seeing them it, it's about imposition and that's the going back to the idea of the imperialist normativity Back home in Nigeria, there's a, there's, a, there's a tribe that is loyal to the British. So post-coloniality operates very slightly similar to settler colonialism, which is that I think that the settlers wanted the land, so they stayed here. They just need labor there. They, they want the oil in Nigeria. And so they just need black bodies to mine the oil and ship it out. And so they didn't need to stay in Nigeria, right? And so they had a surrogate race do their bidding. And so we have the Hausa Fulen hegemony in Nigeria that does exactly what the RCMP does. But now this is black on black, in quote, violence, so to speak. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm coming up with the idea of the imperialist normativity. It's the thinking. It's the way we think first. And so uh, sometimes, uh, even as racialized people, I, I see the idea of we participating in our own racialization a lot of times. Why? Because of the system that we do not often interrogate. Um, I mean, we are interrogating it, but I mean, in the day-to-day -day interactions of people who are not so conscious about these things, um, it doesn't it just doesn't come up it is what it is and then the last pillar is spatial violence and i think i've also mentioned it the naming of streets after white settlers the use of um, um spaces to commit acts of terrorism um i i think that um when you name a space then the space should carry the essence of the people it should carry the culture of the people. And if I am naming it, then my, the name I give it shows my normativity. And so again, it points back to the imperialist normativity to say that if 97% of Thunder Bay is named after white settlers, who probably had nothing to do with Thunder Bay, who probably had, they just named them, then, then it's the idea of violence. And so when, if I'm an Ojibwe child growing up in Thunder Bay, I get the sense that I'm not an owner, if, you know, irrespective of what my parents tell me that we're from Thunder Bay or we're from, we're from Fort Williams First Nations. I get the idea that I'm in an occupy, I'm, I'm being occupied and there's an occupation. I get that sense because I mean, there's Waverly, there's Dufferin, there's, um, uh, 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 there's Pearl, right and these aren't ojibwe names these aren't indigenous names and so i i'm also saying that beyond us pushing for push and and i, I mean i'm also happy about the rematriation project for the public libraries that is ongoing and i think that that's incredible work but i think that pushing it slightly beyond also um, addressing police violence is the idea of renaming. I find it very, very, because I mean, it addresses the other things like white supremacy, it addresses the ideas of, of colonization. I mean, why should we call the adjoint road the only road that leads to the 
to the Fort Williams First Nation, the name that we call it. Why? It should be a name that lifts up indigenous people. It should be a name that helps the psyche of indigenous people. And so uh, in the projection of a progressive, a truly progressive Canada, a truly progressive Thunder Bay, I, I, I think that these four pillars need to be tackled at the same time. Lots of times we get to focus on two. Right now with George Floyd's death, we began to look at the police and look at Black Lives Matter, right? And we're not addressing white supremacy so much. We're not also tackling the ideas of the colonization of, of sorry, we're not also addressing the ideas of space. We're not. And so, yes, I, I, know, I know that somewhere in Minnesota, I think a few months ago, the, the, the Lake, Lake Calhoun was renamed um, by its indigenous name. And I found that really incredible decolonizing work. But in decolonizing Thunder Bay, one of the things that I find that we should begin to also look at I mean, it, it, it gives the, it even tackles police violence because people start to think, oh, we don't really own this space. We can't just do anything we want to do here. And, and this is also, um, I'm, I'm going to stop, stop now, but I, I'm very moved by Barbara Kentner's death. And um, it, she died um, in 2017. And um, most of the work that I right now become very interested in was inspired by her death. And I hope that um, in the long haul, she hasn't died in vain when we begin to look at all these things, particularly the ideas around spatial violence. I think that of all, it, it's the most subtle. We can touch the others, but that one is so subtle. And if we can hit the nail on the head with special violence, then gradually we can address the other three issues, white supremacy, identity colonization, and the Marshall case. Thank you for the opportunity. Very incredible time with you, with you all. Thank you so much, Nate. And thank you uh, also, AD and Ivory. Um, I apologize to some of the folks who have sent in questions since there's so many, we're not gonna be able to have time to get to them. So in order to get to the maximum amount of questions and to hear from our panelists more, I'm just gonna launch into the first question, um, which the panelists might also be able to read in the Zoom chat. It's from Dr. Jessica Jurgaitis. She says, thank you, Ivory, Patrick, and AD for all your insights so far. I'm wondering if you can comment on defunding the police and what's at stake with the idea of reform versus abolition at this moment. This morning, Desmond Cole spoke about reform as a way to regulate the violence, as opposed to stopping the violence. At the same time, you might think about abolition beyond policing prisons, et cetera, to a logic of punishment, surveillance, disposability, and so on. Thinking about both of these things, what does abolition look like or mean to you, and how do you envision defunding the police moving forward? Whoever wants to jump in on this, please, please do. We'd love to listen. Uh, somebody want to comment or? <laughs> question, I'm thinking about it. Okay. Um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, just be kind of short about it. Um, I think we should, I think we have um, the ability as a community to make the police um, irrelevant, like a police response irrelevant. Um, I believe, um, you know, I think the, the clan systems have been here for, you know, since millennia, since, um, um, you know, for, it's been existing for, you know, thousands of years and um, wasn't a need for uh, police before. And um, yeah, I think like it's, they're a very new concept like within the past 300 years. So um, I think we can get there again, <laughs> support it. Yeah, I mean, do you mind if I ask you when y'all are out on patrol if you guys often go to Fort William First Nation to do your patrols and why or why not? Um, no, we don't go there. Um, 
there's not a need for us. Uh, everybody takes care of each other. Um, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's just, there's just a need here in Thunder Bay hmm. for, um, yeah, for uh, counter surveillance. Uh, I think in terms of defunding the police, uh, I think it's a great idea, but it doesn't solve the problem. And I think it's actually an example of pushing um, a type of work onto largely female dominated uh, careers and people who are also paid less than the police. Uh, and there has actually been some backlash from um, social workers about defunding the police. Um, and so abolition, what does that look like to me? Uh, I am a very strong, radical black feminist. So to me, abolition really does mean uh, taking down the state um, as it is and rebuilding local um, indigenous led in allyship with other um, oppressed and racialized people um, communities. And from there with uh, a focus on local production and local voices, we'll see uh, a reform of violence in Canada. I think that from the position of defunding the police, it's it's a very political. The politicality of the politicality of it is um, very critical to colonialism, and because it is so crucial to colonialism, um, it might not be a realistic um, approach as long as, as long as the state remains as is. So um, for me, abolition would mean not forgetting the past, but coming together in smaller communities, right? And working together to build uh, future where we continue to reduce the need for the kind of policing that um, we currently have. Back home in Nigeria, I live in a commune. It's like a Jewish kibbutz. And in that commune, we don't have police. Police don't have to come there because everybody knows each other. And we live that way. We have, it's almost a self-governing community. And so for me, abolition would mean people of like minds, different colors, different races, just like we are here right now, coming together gradually to say, look, I see you, I can live with you. And then we begin by ourselves to decolonize. So this is an institution, we don't wait for the state to um, defund the police because the state um, thrives on the existence of the police. We may not um, fully accept that, but that is what it is. If, if you look at the expropriation of land, if you look at the use of natural resources to um, um, the, the seizure of land for natural ex resource exploitation, then you see why the police is needed. The police is a, fa is a part of the state's fabric to continue the settler um, society. Yeah. Thank you. I guess uh, we'll move on to the next question. This next question comes from Meg. Meg, I hope you're cool with me calling you Meg. Meg asks, Thank you, Ivory, AD, and Patrick. I was just wondering what your stances are on seeing color versus not seeing color. I have seen many varying opinion on this, and I'm wondering your thoughts. Before I hand it over, I'll just identify as someone who is literally colorblind, so I find it uniquely annoying when people say, right, like, oh, I don't see race, because what they're saying is they don't see racism. They can actually see color just fine, and I think, Patrick, your last conversation about us seeing each other kind of touched on this. And I'm wondering if uh, Ivory or Adrian or even you want to uh, jump on in on some conversations about seeing each other or not seeing color and what color blindness, role, what role that plays within this conversation. Um, <laughs> I think that's, uh, if like people who say they don't see colors, that think that's kind of messed up. I um, think you should, um, you know, like um, acknowledge who people are and where they come from and um, yeah, as, 
I don't know, just my opinion. Mix, language. <laughs> so I'll jump in here. Not seeing color is a form of erasure because you should be able to see my color and accept me. You shouldn't need to not see my color and then just assimilate me with your understanding of people based on white culture and just assimilate me into that and say, oh, well, I don't see color. You're just like everyone else. But I want my culture. I'm very proud of my culture. I want my culture and my color to be recognized and accepted, which is why seeing color and accepting is extremely important as opposed to the erasure of my color in order to accept me. I quite agree. Um, I think we tackle racism from a very individualistic um, point of view. And what that means is seeing people exactly as they are and accepting them exactly as they are. And pushing back to my ideas around not yielding to the software of imperialist normativity and questioning that um, normalization of racism for yourself as an individual. I think that's really important. Helps us to accept each other as we are. Thank you. One quick last question before we shut it down since I'll try and keep it close to 5.30. Uh, this question comes from Dr. Angie Wong who's interested. Um, if someone's interested in thinking like you or critiquing along the same lines that you're critiquing, is there any sources that you can point them to, uh, things you've read, things that have inspired you, things that have helped inform your thinking that you'd like uh, to share just before we all sign off here? Well, mine are going to be big names. They're obvious, but I always point people towards um, essays by Angela Davis, specifically on policing. Uh, there's a really great book by Robin Maynard about policing the Black state. Um, there's, I'm going to forget the name right now. Actually, I'm going to go, the book is right next to me. I'm going to go get it. And it's another great one, but I'll recommend it. Perfect. Ivory, uh, Renee, you guys got any suggestions while she grabs that book? Uh, it's always good to read Pedagogy of the Oppressed. <laughs> that's, a, that's a common one, but it's, it's, it's a good reminder. Um, it's, yeah, that, that pretty much changed my life. And um, I, I needed a, a dictionary every, you know, um, every second sentence. <laughs> um, but it was uh, you know, slow to get through it. But um, yeah, to really absorb that is, is amazing. So, um, you know, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Ferrer. Um, I, I would recommend um, Usual Suspects, The Skin We're In by Desmond Cole. Um, next Time, The Fire by James Baldwin. Um, Tanehisi Coates, Between the World and Me. And Policing Black Lives by Robin Maynard. Um, these four books kind of form. And then, um, as we have always done by Liam Simpson, the, these five books kind of help to ground um, my thinking about metaphors and that how these things are not particularly literal. They, they're just so subconscious in the minds of everyone. And that's the reason why we, we have these productions in terms of behavior. And so just to jump in, uh, the last book is The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander extremely well written amazing book if there's one book that i would say if you want to just read that and know a majority it would be that book perfect thank you AD. um this is where i would ask the audience to applaud and since we're in covid times and that's not possible i speak for everyone in a very serious round of applause um, i found this uh super energizing very informative and it was a huge honor for me to even be involved in moderating this panel so thank you so so much to everyone involved um, I'm going to end the call here and I'll wave it bye to everyone as we do at the end of these awkward Zooms. Um, but thank you again so much, everybody, for participating. And uh, it's been such a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.